evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 26th edition of the Time of the Writer Festival presented by the Center for Creative Arts at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. My name is Ismail Mohammed, and I'm the director for the Center for Creative Arts. On behalf of our team, we hope that you have a wonderful festival with us this year. I'd like to commence by paying homage to the founders of this festival and whose passion, whose energy has sustained it for 26 years. I want to honor the University of KwaZulu-Natal and its leadership for the vision that they've had for supporting the Center for Creative Arts over the last 25 years. I honor the writers, the poets, the wordsmiths, whose passion, whose knowledge, whose vision, whose words inspire us, challenge us, provoke us, and make us realize that we're alive. To you, our audience, thank you for your passionate engagement with the Center for Creative Arts. In 2020, two days before President Cyril Ramaphosa announced the national lockdown, the Time of the Writer Festival had to immediately put all its visiting writers onto the plane and send them back home. We were the first festival in South Africa to then venture into the online space two days after the national lockdown. And over the last two and a half years, we've presented every single festival in the online space. We had a choice. We could either wait it out or we could act in that space. At the Center for Creative Arts, we believed in acting in that space. It may not have been the ideal space, because we wanted to touch hands. We wanted to be together in the same room, but dialogue never ceases. And we're delighted that we continued to be the torchbearers at that incredibly difficult time and set the benchmark for other South African festivals to follow suit. In that period, the National Institute for Humanities and Social Sciences acknowledged us with an award for best digital content in the humanities for our festival Jumba. But they also nominated us in the same category for our Poetry Africa Festival. Over the two and a half years, whilst we've not been able to engage in the live space, our online audiences grew enormously. Not only did it create an awareness about our festivals within the country, but it took us beyond borders and brought for us a whole new consumer base for people who enjoy the word from across the border. Tonight, we continue, whilst we gather here, to continue to live stream so that those audiences that we've built over the last two and a half years continue to engage with us. Tonight, we're delighted to have Professor Klongwa, the Dean of the School of the Arts, whose incredible passion and support continues to keep us going at the Center for the Creative Arts. I'm going to call on you, Professor Klongwa, to briefly address us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Mohammed, um, for the special welcome um, to all our writers and uh, to our audience this evening. Uh, my name is Nobu Lhlongwa. Um, I'm the Dean and the Head of the School of Arts in the College of Humanities at the University um, of KwaZulu-Natal. Um, I no longer have eyes, so allow me to have my other eyes so that I will be able to speak briefly. So I'll be very brief, just three minutes. Three minutes will be, will be fine. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, I would like to take this opportunity and um, welcome all of you uh, to this uh, official opening night of the 26th edition of the Time of the Writer Festival that is presented by the Center for Creative Arts. Um, at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. Um, our Deputy Vice-Chancellor, uh, Professor Ntlantlan Kize, uh, sends his greetings um, to all of you, uh, our funders, uh, our partners, um, um, all the writers and all our, our stakeholders. So this is an important event um, in, the, in the CCA, in the School of Arts, 
in the University of KwaZulu Natal's calendar, uh, as it gives all the stakeholders an opportunity uh, to showcase their books, to showcase the work that they have written, and also to share skills with young and aspiring writers. So this is a very, very important opportunity. Um, the festival theme for this year, as, uh, as you can see, um, it's entitled Placemaking, Influence, Roots, Imagination, and Expression. So this is a very, very important theme. Um, it is very important that like, we understand where we come from as people, understanding our past, understanding our heritage, where we come from as South Africa, um, in terms of our roots, where our leaders are coming from. And with that in mind, um, in 2023, um, we decided that we will focus on women in literary arts. And that is why this evening, um, we are honoring Dr. Sindwe Magona as our featured author this year. She is celebrating her 80th birthday. A big round of applause, <laughs> Dr. Sindwe Magona. Um, Center for Creative Arts. Godwa Usahamba, Usaye Mazweni, where she is being honored as well during the course of this year. So another big round of applause for Dr. Mapan. <laughs> so this evening, she will be in conversation with Zugiswa. So now we're looking forward to, to the conversation, Zugiswa, um, with Dr. Magona uh, this evening. And uh, we, we really, really have a, uh, having a very strong lineup uh, in our program, as we have seen, we do have the likes of Makosa Zanataba, Dudubusa Nidube, and all the very, very strong artists that we have during the course of this festival. So I would like to acknowledge, importantly, our partners and our funders, uh, especially the University of KwaZulu-Natal, the College of Humanities, the KwaZulu-Natal, uh, DSAC, the National Arts Council, the PSP Fund, the National Department of Sports, Arts and Culture, the Ukrainian Embassy, um, Luca Lunago, yes, youth program, uh, who are doing an excellent work as they are funding the interns that we are hosting at the Center for Creative Arts. We're really, really grateful. Our festival partners, um, uh, Alliance Francais, Vert's Writing Center, um, the University of Johannesburg Art and Culture, our Institute for Social Economic uh, Research, um, and uh, more importantly, we wouldn't be here. Uh, if our um, women curators didn't do an excellent work. Um, I do want to acknowledge our festival curators, Sibahle Kwela, Nolwa Zinene, Scott Finn, Nomtanda Zoshandu. So we are really, really proud of you. A big round of applause to, to all of you. And by the way, they are our intent in the Center for Creative Arts, but they have done an excellent work so we're really really proud of you and your future i must say is really really looking bright um our festival mentors dr isma mohammed uh mrs pindila Shongwa, thank you very much colleagues thank you so much for the excellent work that you do uh our hundred writers who are featured in our program uh we do have uh, our outreach program that you'll be enjoying during the course of the of the two weeks uh, through KCAP Community Art Centre, through Wishini Art Centre, the Lutuli Museum, Dennis Haley Centre, Schools and the Prisons. So those are the programmes that we will be having. So before I sit down, let me acknowledge and thank all the staff in the Centre for Creative Arts and who have contributed to the organisation of this festival this year. And I wish you all the best in the next few days. Enjoy the time of the Writer Festival, our 26th edition. Thank you very much. Durban has more than just the bunny chow. <laughs> we are the UNESCO City of Literature, and we take pride in that title. So tonight, as we host this evening, 
we own that title and you are all part of it as well. So I also want to acknowledge the presence of Mr. Eric Eppelgren from the municipality, the Devon Itaquini municipality, who is here today and whose support for the Center for Creative Arts is also boundless. So thank you very much. I also want to acknowledge Ms. Chantal Beale from the US consulate for many, many years. They've been supporters of the, uh, the, the Center for Creative Arts across our festivals. Professor Hlongwa has acknowledged a number of other partners. We don't do it without joining hands. Tonight, we join hands with the Alliance Francais, who've been incredibly kind to us by allowing us to host several events in this venue, and we look forward to a lot more. It's my pleasure to call on Ms. Deborah Ewing, the chairperson of the Alliance Francais, to acknowledge us, but I also want to acknowledge the presence of the director of the Alliance Francais, Mr. Gilles Odos. Thank you. Up, over to Ms. Ba Ms. Deborah Ewing, thank you. Good evening, everybody. San Bonani Nonke. Bonsoir à toutes et tous. It's my great pleasure to welcome you here to the Alliance Francaise of Durban. Um, suis ravi de vous souhaiter les bienvenus ici à l'Alliance Francaise de Durban. <laughs> so I will be very short just to acknowledge everybody and to please say that you are family here, not just for this evening, but for any event that is hosted uh, by Centre for Creative Arts or any creative partners um, in this city or in the world. This is meant to be a global meeting point. So I'm glad that that is what you have made it this evening, all of you. Thank you. So, um, yes, welcome to the first time of the writer that we've had here at the Alliance, although we have had events before. Um, Thank you very much and welcome to the Dean of the School of Arts, uh, to uh, Prof Longwa, um, to uh, Dr. Sindiwe Magona. It's wonderful to have you here um, as the featured author of the festival, to the director, Dr. Mohammed of the CCA, to all your team, to the Time of the Right, to the curat curatorial team who work so hard to make these such fantastic events. Um, the director and the board of the Alliance, um, to all the international and South African writers who are here and who are here in Durban for the festival, if, even if they're not here this evening, and to the whole arts community and representatives of the city. Um, so we're looking forward to a conversation between uh, two writers, uh, Professor Magona and, also, uh, and Zuki Swawana, um, so we're going to hear all about um, the, the life and times of this amazing award-winning author, teacher, translator. Um, I hope that you have a wonderful time listening, but also meeting everybody here. Please come back for the other events. Please come back for the other festivals, because this isn't a once-off partnership. And uh, you are welcome at any time. Thank you. See you bonga. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Deborah. Whilst we depend incredibly on social media these days to take the word out, we're also incredibly grateful to the men and women who work in the media and who believe in supporting the arts. So to all the people from the media here tonight and to our marketing representative, Marlene Knoll, thank you for taking the word out, not just about the festival, but about what's going to be said during the festival, because that's incredibly important, the conversations that continue to happen. Now, Professor Klongwa has acknowledged the, editorial, the, the curatorial team, but I want to just go one step further, because in 35 years of working in the arts sector as a manager, as a director, this was the very first time in 35 years where I had to do literally nothing, absolutely nothing, 
Nothing at all, because everything was done for me. I simply had to just sign dotted lines. So I'm close to retirement. <laughs> I want to acknowledge the four curators, and I'm going to ask them to stand, because they've done an incredible job of making me and Sipendile take a back seat this year. Sibashle Kweller, who's been the head curator. <laughs> oh, there. Scout Finn. <laughs> Nolwazi Nene. <laughs> and Nom Tandazo Shandu. These young women have identified which writers to bring to the program this year. They've put together the, the, the curatorial threads that binds the program together, and they've literally taken care of all the logistics that goes into the making of a festival. I think they're taller than a 22 million flag. You'll agree. <laughs> right, we stand on their shoulders, and we look 22 meters tall. So great. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, don't go, Shabashle. Before we hand you over to Zaki Suawana and our featured author for this evening, uh, Dr. Magona, I'm going to ask the head curator to briefly address us, Sebashle Kwela. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, what an honor to be a black woman in South Africa given a voice. What an honor to be a black woman in South Africa to be given this voice. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and I welcome you to the 26th edition of the Time of the Writer Festival. My name is Batle Kwela, and I was heading this beautiful project with my co-curators, who you've just met. And I'd like to first start by acknowledging our Dean of School, Professor Thongwa. Thank you for your support. I'd also love to acknowledge our featured author, Dr. Sindri Makwana. We honor you, we love you, we respect you, and the work that you produce. I'd love to thank Dr. Ismail Mohammed. I'd like to acknowledge you for giving me this opportunity and platform today. And also all of um, the relevant parties that have supported this project. The curatorial vision for the 26th Time of the Writer Festival is placemaking, reassessing where we are as a people, as a country, as communities, but also seeing where we could go with what we have now. Roots, where we come from, the beautiful female black voices that encourage black bodies like us to soar and pursue our passions. Influence, where we are now, the contemporary voices, who contributes to that and who it represents and why. Expression, a world where we can seek and speak, where we can be and we are allowed to and we are heard. Imagination, where we can reimagine a world of forces from where we come from to where we are to where we could be. Thank you so much for honoring the invitation to being here with me, with us, in this very monumental time of my life. And with that being said, again, my co-curatorial team, your love, support through this entire process is so appreciated. Dr. Ismail Mohammed, this platform means the world to me. Spindi Lethongwa, I look to you and the work that you produce and you being a voice in your space, and I wish to be there too. My team, your support, your work, each and every role is honored, and I thank you for that. My beautiful writers, facilitators, who have allowed this program to happen, we wouldn't be here without you. I thank you, and I hope that this festival is an experience, a layered, beautiful experience that you will enjoy as we have just honored the people who refuse to be silenced by the noise. 
the pen that refuses to also run out. Thank you. <laughs> On that note, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> On that note, we are ready to proceed to the main program, our in conversation with the Dr. Sindhu Makona and Buzugu Sawana. I'd love to call them up. Thank you, guys. Good evening, Durban. Hello? And everybody who's online, can I kindly ask you to please stand up and give a round of applause as Dr. Ma'am Sindhu Magona comes to stage. Okay, sorry, I need to really tell you that when we say a round of applause, it goes something like this. So a round of applause for Dr. Magona. <laughs> Thank you very much. You can sit down. Right. Shall we get into it? I know you've been waiting for a long time and you've been asking me what we're going to talk about. <laughs> um, for those not in the know, uh, Dr. Cindy Magona wrote her first book in 1990. Uh, was published in 1990 uh, to my children's children. It was a memoir. She has since gone on to write novels, uh, poetry collection, children's books. Uh, so you can really very much call her genre non-binary. <laughs> or genre bending. <laughs> Whatever you prefer. <laughs> Welcome. Dr. Magona, and oh yeah, because it was not enough, all these fabulous things. Last year, at the age of 79, she decided she wanted to get a PhD. Congratulations, ma'am. Thank you, thank you very much. You make us feel like underachievers, honestly. <laughs> now, let's start this conversation and perhaps Let's start from the beginning. All the different genres, what has led you to do that as opposed to may perhaps maybe sticking to novels or maybe plays or poetry or children's books? What drives Dr. Sindhuwe Magona? I get it. <laughs> the answer is very simple because I don't know what I'm doing. I write, there's a, there's a poem to that effect. I could read it to you, but I will answer from memory. You know this young lady who was talking here? Butle, Butle, Butle. You know, if I weren't who I am, I would have stood up and said, my job is done. In that poem, one of the things I say, the poem is called Why I, I Write. Mm. When, I, when the, my first book was published, I was 49. I was invited to a uh, conference at the University of Cape Town. I was working at the United Nations at headquarters then, all the way from New York to Cape Town. My first writer's conference so you can imagine how I was feeling. I never knew I could write, never mind publish a book. So this was a bit of like a big surprise and shock to me. So the, at the, towards the end of this four day conference, a professor stands up and uh, makes the startling statement for me. You know how you know something, but you know you, you don't know you know it. I knew we didn't write kind of vaguely, but this man says, since black, black, or bandu then, women got published in this country. This is 1990. Since 
Bantu women were published, started being published. In 1990, only five had been published. Then he goes on to, to say, in fact, this is throughout Africa. African women will write one or two books. Even if it's a novel, it will be kind of autobiographical. And then they disappear. Me, myself, I made up my mind right then. I was not going to disappear. I, did, yeah. yes. I thought, I don't know what I'm doing, but I have published a book. I'm going to write and write and write. It doesn't matter what. I'm going to write. I never went to school to learn any writing. It didn't stop. I mean, this one book was out, and then the next, and then the next. You know, the, the poem I'm talking about says, I write so that children who look like me in this country and all over the continent and in the diaspora can go up grow up seeing someone who looks like them yes. doing this thing that I never knew I could do. No one was doing it, no one I met. So that they could believe. They could believe they too could. You know, people do as people do. It's called role modeling. Yes. So when you talk like that, I've succeeded. <laughs> <laughs> That is why I write. Fantastic. Thank you. That's such a beautiful, as, as beautiful an answer as that speech that we heard from Smartly, which brought tears to my eyes, by the way. Um, you have a new uh, uh, collection of essays, and some of them are old. You wrote about them way back, called I Write the Yearning Void, and that's coming out in June. Uh, I've had the luck to actually read it in advance. And um, yeah, I think I'm gonna go into it as I also move into the novels and we can just do a discussion on that. So in one of the essays, which uh, <laughs> you know what I'm gonna talk about. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know. There are lots of essays, there are about 30. Yes, they are. Uh, so they are actually, <laughs> There are actually three sections. Uh, there is coming into writing, there is uh, writing about uh, pressing issues, and then there is uh, writing about my writing. So in the, the, the three sections of this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful uh, collection that's coming out with uh, Vitz University Press in June or July. So please pre-order your copies, because if I tell you it's fabulous, you know it's fabulous. <laughs> anyway, so. Um, in one of your essays, you talk about your um, you talk you talk about uh, a, a little experience that you had. Well, not it's a little; it's it's very formative. The experience of uh, not being able to work, you know, because uh, you got suspended because you were expecting a child uh, for two years, and then you uh, then was put in a space where now you had two more children coming and uh, so you couldn't work as a teacher and then you ended up thinking about having to work as a domestic worker because uh, the husband did a run uh, when you were four months pregnant and you said in that in that essay you had this quote that was so beautiful that um, I thought my god I wish I'd written this and Essentially, the court is um, uh, because this is during apartheid, apartheid. I'm going to succeed. Uh, it, no, in spite of the government, despite the government, to spite the government, I'm going to succeed. Do you still feel that way? And um, and I thought to myself, I you know you, you wrote this when you. When you were in your 20s, you said this when you were in your 20s. And I thought to myself, hey, this is post-apartheid, and somehow I kind of feel the same way. Do you feel the same way? Yes, <laughs> to cut it short. But you know, uh, that whole uh, segment of, 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 of uh, the story of my life, that appears in book two. I've written two books of autobiography. It was one book, but it was too long, and it was chopped into two. 
and the second book, which is called Forced to Grow, starts with the sentence, I was a has-been, Hoivech, at the age of 23. And then I go into what had happened, which Zuki has just told you. If you're 23, four months pregnant, then you, this is your third baby, and your husband runs away. You can't, that was at a time when Bandu, we could not, we were not, as we were not citizens in the country, you could not apply for social aid. So I was on my own. And then, you know, we come from a segment of the population that both we love children. Yes, Africans love children. But you dare not be a woman with children and no visible husband during my time. It may be different now. Then there's a name. There are names for that kind of food. So you know you have fallen in the eyes of the community. You are, you know, like rubbish. I got so angry at my husband, at society. I got angry at the government too, who wouldn't find a way of seeing me as a human being deserving of aid. So I, I thought to myself, you know what? Despite the government, in spite of the government, to spite the government, I will be something. I'm going to retrieve my life. I'm not going to wait. But the message is, you know, don't wait for other people to help you. Help is in you. you. We are all born with the capacity to overcome anything and everything. Just find it inside you. Get angry enough. Get angry enough to say, I'm going to do it. Even, you know, when there are people laughing at you, telling you you are nonsense, you are garbage, you are not what other people, how other people define you. You are who you tell yourself you are. And you better tell yourself you are a, a good person, a great person with limitless abilities. We don't use even half, a fraction of the abilities inside these bodies. Find them in you. You have them already. Find them and use them. Give it all you've got. There's no practice run in living. This is it. You know, poverty, which is where I, I grew up poor. We didn't know that we were all in the same boat. In my 20s, I hit rock bottom from poverty to destitution. I thought of my children. If I couldn't give my three children what my semi-literate parents had given me, what do I call myself? You know, as do, doing domestic work, I see women who are three generations. Their grandmothers were domestic workers. Their mothers, and they are. I vowed my daughters would never be domestic work. No, they wouldn't do domestic work. Why should they? I should find a way that they become one level up. That's what life is about. Each generation should lift the next up, not down. That's why I wrote this. Because I, you know, you ask me what I see now. I see people helped with grants. But it doesn't seem to be grants that move you out of poverty. I have a problem with that. Nothing should help me by cementing me where I am. If you're helping me, get me unstuck and out. Why do you give me a grant for 18 continuous years? Delay them, not defeat them, not these 18 years that I, can, I cannot move. 18 continuous years? For 18 years. It took me 10 years. But in 10 years, I was no longer 23. I was 33. I was doing a master's at Columbia University. 
I didn't have matric when I was abandoned. My matric is by correspondence, self-help. My A-levels correspondence, self-help. My BA correspondence, self-help. The government wasn't helping. I scrubbed. You know what you scrub to eat. In Toko Zekusha, scrub cop. Domestic work and there was no government. That government told you in plain, you know, words, no help for you. This government says help. I'm trying to figure out the difference when I look at the outcomes. I'm trying to figure out whether the me today who's being helped for 18 continuous years is better than, than the me then who helped herself out and in 10 years from non-matric to matric, A-levels and degree and doing masters at Columbia University with no help from government. I'm not saying poor people shouldn't be helped. Don't get me wrong. Poor people shouldn't be helped to stay poor. No, I have a problem with that. My next novel will be dealing with, this one is called, It Takes a Village <laughs> to Raise a, 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 a Child. The question is, what happens when the village sleeps? And right now, the way I see things, village South Africa is snoring. Words of wisdom. Thank you, ma'am. Um, apart from chasing the tale of my father's cattle, you say that you generally write from provocation. And obviously, one can see, anybody who's read uh, When the Village Sleeps can see that. You've read the, the essays. <laughs> I've read the essays, but I've also right. read this. And I've read all the... Ah, can I do my I do job? Right. I prepare. From, yeah, I did yeah. the interview. Provocation. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, and uh, with, with, with that said, I think I would really like you to uh, maybe just provoke our audience into understanding where you are with just a little excerpt from you. Just tease them. I will. Okay. I will. This book was provoked from me by re an article I read in a community magazine. 16 year old, sitting there holding a baby, being interviewed by a social worker. This is about maybe 20 years ago, so it's more than history. In the answers she gives is, I, I started trying to get pregnant from when I was 13. So she succeeded at 15, she's 16 as a baby. Oh, I used to drink before I got pregnant. After I got pregnant, you think she's going to say I stopped drinking? I started taking drugs. I wanted this baby to be deformed. She is holding her deformed baby. The end of the article are words from the social worker. This is a growing trend in the townships. It's not a crime to deform your fetus. Growing trend in South Africa. What do I read? Oh, I need, you know, you I know need my other doing. eyes. I think you marked it, you marked it in your book. Yeah? You marked it in that book. I think I did. Oh, how am I going to do this? No, 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 I'll hold this one. You marked it in here. What is this? Where did I get this no, from? No, that's mine. You, 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 Writers write. This is a little bit <coughs> outdated, but these are the books I have written. Mostly children's books. It's fine. Hmm? 
Oh. She said, writers write because they don't know how to. They rather not talk. <laughs> <laughs> Let me stand. Honestly, I'll read better, I think. I'll also breathe better. This is when the, the young lady was pregnant and the reaction of the family and the reaction of friends. And then the book also includes, you know, the invisible ones, the old, the ancestors. So all that is written in poetry when they come in. If the family was having a hard time accepting her coming child, not so, Busi's Cassie friends. They were in celebration mode, even Tandy, who was spending more and more time away from school with a new blesser. They got together and gave her a baby shower from which she returned giggling and delighted. She had to be helped into the house, staggering under a mountain of boxes and packages all wrapped in bright, bright colors. Baby clothes, toys, and even a few books, much to the surprise of many. Generous hilarity filled the hearts of her friends because they knew she didn't have it easy at home. Some had been there before her and all knew what happened. Social disapproval so thick you could cut it with a knife. By the end of the ceremony, Busi was dizzy, bursting with pride. But back home, however, that pride had absolutely no place. No place at all, at all, at all. When she entered the house, her mother, visiting from Mrs. Bird, made her, made her cringe with a look that cut through her as though with X-ray eyes she had looked through her and seen nothing. This look declared her non-partisan status and it left Busi harrowed inside. A slap, kick, fist, even verbal assault would have been better than this erasure, silent disapproval. But between the two of them now, mother and daughter, nix, nothing. Busi hurried to reach her room with all her presents. See the difference between how her friends treat her and how she's treated at home. And the ancestors come in. <clears throat> Go home and do not sleep. There come pools of blood. There come pools of blood. Go home and do not sleep. There comes the end of humanity. As dead flies give perfume a bad smell, so a little learning outweighs wisdom and honor. Go home and do not sleep. Your fathers will sell you out. Go home and do not sleep. You too will sell your mothers out. The heart of the wise inclines to the right, but the heart of the fool to the left. Go home and do not sleep. You are the base supporting the people. Go home and do not sleep. Your families are in danger. If a learned one's anger rises against you, do not leave your position. Go home and do not sleep. There comes a time of darkness. Go home and do not sleep. We will not be here forever. Calmness can crush great arrows to bluntness. There is an evil I have heard over the loudest microphone. Go home and do not sleep. Give service to the coming generation. Go home and do not sleep. I say the real war has come. The sort of error 
that arises from a professor fools are put in many high positions while the wise occupy low ones. I don't know why you don't want to read more. You're such a theatrical <laughs> reader. Uh, when the village sleeps uh, formed part of your um, doctoral thesis, and in fact, it is the title of your doctoral thesis as well, but the book came out in 2021 and you got your PhD on 9 September uh, 2022. It's six months now. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yes. That's why I am still so hebrekerach about being addressed as Dr. Ah, no, uh, it's new, you see. Kalokwe must give you flowers. <laughs> But also it comes from being uh, irritated with myself because I have four honorary doctorates. And so Eastern people said, Dr. Macon, I would, you know, I, I don't believe that much in myself sometimes. So I would always say, oh, they are honorary doctorates. Oh, they are honor. And then I thought, get this up is, and do your own. So this you is don't where have, I was going with this you question. You don't have to be you know, apologizing. So now I did my own. Call me Dr. Magona. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it is also seriously speaking, to say to black children, young people, you are all children where I stand from, with no disrespect, it's never too late. But it is also against ageism. Mm. No one is too old to do anything if they want mm. to. Mm. Mm. Um, and, and on that note... And I mean anything. <laughs> uh, 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 uh. You see, here's, here's my thing. Uh. <laughs> Yes, I think. Me, I was just, I, me, I was just waiting for UK Zerin to give me an honorary PhD. But now, now you're putting too much pressure on me. I beg. No. <laughs> uh, but uh, so that that uh, the 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 PhD. I was going to start by saying, you know. You answered the question already. You, you took it. You took the words out of my mouth. I was going to say, uh, what did you? But here's the thing: um, the PhD is in creative writing, and you did your masters in social work. But I, can I just observe and just say, I think even with all your writing, you're still very much a social worker because I feel constantly: uh, is that intentional or? It's, it's just part of your personality. Because I felt like every time I read your work, I feel like I'm learning something. I feel like I'm being pushed to be a little bit more than I can be. Uh, is that intentional or you're just like, well, you know, let's see. You know, I, I, I am a very surprised person at the way my life has turned. And knowing who I was, I look at people as they are and see what they could be. Honestly, I look at somebody and I think, oh my God, if they could only wake up to their own potential. If you could only wake up to what is inside you already, waiting to burst out and bless the world. We are all on this planet, on this earth for one reason, to leave it a better place than we found it. And nothing will improve anywhere in the world without all of us thriving, becoming who we were meant to be. So honestly, I write, and hopefully I might inspire, aspire, whatever, someone into waking up into the roadblocks you can use as stepping stones. Really, and the harder the spot you are in, the harder you must fight to get out. Why are you seated and rested? Quindao ebushung. If it hurts you, common sense says get out. One of the, uh, one of the essays there is do not choose poverty. Do not choose poverty. 
Fantastic. Thank you so much. I actually need to upload that. But we're going we're, we're gonna to go to a little more, ha like a happier space, and uh, just to discuss chasing the tail of my father's cattle. And you say that, um, and, and you know, I absolutely enjoyed reading this guy, this father who's just absolutely against everything and against all the norms, he's just going to do things in the village where he's going to raise his own daughter, he's going to do this. And everybody is like looking at him like, okay, what type of man are you? You know, he doesn't even take another wife. He doesn't, you know, what led you to that? Well, I know what led you to that, but you probably need to tell them. Because, because you've read the yes, essay. Yes, <laughs> of course. <laughs> uh, uh, that's the one book that was not provoked out of me. It's a book I wrote for my father. And, but also it was nudged out of me. <laughs> well, yeah, you did I say wrote the Beauty's Gift, mm. a book that was uh, hailed as one of the best books on, uh, anti, on the anti-HIV and AIDS fight. But the book is about four, five women. Beauty is the one who dies, and she is HIV positive. And her gift, read the book, you will, you will hear what the, the gift is. But each of these five women, and they are all black, black like me, but they are professional. They are not the tip, because there was this, told me, this tale <laughs> that women stay in talk, you know, in talk, talk, toxic relationships. Toxic re relations because they need roofs over their head, they need them. These are women in their professions, and HIV and AIDS are, you know, it, you know, hit everybody. Uh -huh. Not just poor black women who didn't have money in their pockets. And this is what I was trying to highlight, that don't rest on your laurels, don't, laurels, don't, don't kid yourself, it won't happen to you because you are a social worker, you are a nurse, you are a professor. No, no. We are all vulnerable because they are old, because they are young. It hits any, wake up to the threat, you know, when it presents yourself. So what was your question? Uh, so, uh, uh, no, no let, let's leave that because I actually want to go to what oh, you no, want. No, no, yeah. you know. well, well, so no. So when, 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 All right. <laughs> When, you know, during the, 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 you know, when you have a book, then there's a publicity. Uh, the, uh, publicity is, uh, Young men, course. black men would, are you, are, you, are, you, you seem to hate us, you seem to hate us. Then I say, well, show me this black man. I just cannot resist writing about, who are so admirable. I must write about them. And then it hit me. My father was such a man. Where is the book about my father and other fathers? of that, you know, man with whom we were safe. Hmm. There's a story I've written somewhere, I don't know, remember in all these essays I've written, where I lost my ticket, we live in retreat, I go to Langa High School, I lost my train ticket. And the data who gave me the money didn't want to kiss me even on the cheek. He gave me the money because I was vulnerable, a child who needed to get home. And when I was working in Sea Point as a domestic worker, I, I, I missed the last bus. The last bus. You know, those days, if you were standing somewhere in Cape Town and it was after 8 o'clock, and you needed to prove to the police why you were there. What's so good, the dang year? Because you were not supposed to be visible after working hours in a white area. I'm standing there feeling like. I don't know, so scared. And this black man approaches me, finds out I've missed the last bus, and says, come with me. Takes me to a compound. You know what a compound is? Hmm. Men, who, you know, sleeping there who work for a company. Go, go, get up. Boy, get up. He leaps out, I sleep in that bed. There wasn't even a joke about there's a woman here. I wanted to write about men like that. And thank you for doing that. It's, yeah. it, it's, it's a very beautiful book. And Jojo being also in the rural areas, I think, um, was, was 
you know, there's this idea that only a certain enlightened, well-read, and he wasn't, he wasn't a lot of those things, but he just takes agency, and it's heart. that, heart. it's that beauty and how he has heart, and even when he, when he, when he takes his brother-in-law who beats his sister, you know, type of thing, he's just like, well, everybody else knows about it, but nobody is doing anything, and and that was beautiful, you know, and agency. I think, yeah, and I think we probably it's something that we're craving as a society even much more despite the fact that the book was was written uh, as, uh, as having happened like some time ago and yeah, I, George just stands for truth really? irrespective if it's his brother who is wrong mm. he point you know point we need out. to call it out mm. whoever is doing something wrong call it out even call yourself out mm. Mm. Uh, which leads me to, uh, because you brought beauty gifts up and I was going to go there anyway. Um, now, you, you did mention uh, poor women and, and you are absolutely right, but I think because we stay in a patriarchal world, it's still even, even, even middle class women, even rich women, we've had reports of, uh, we've seen it, we've had uh, women who are CEOs of companies getting killed by their partners, for instance, in this country. Uh, so I, I, and I, I, elsewhere. Yes, so I, 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 and elsewhere, obviously. But, I, but I, I, I then perhaps am here asking for your words of wisdom. Um, how does, how do women uh, negotiate patriarchy? You know, how do you say, how do you negotiate? How do you say, okay, you know what? I'm not going to, I'm not going to put up with this uh, because maybe you're a CEO or maybe you're a, you're a dean or whatever, and then uh, you get home and then your husband says there is no dean here. You know, <laughs> so. And then, and then, and then the in-laws say, "Hey, we need you to clone Ipa because this is not this is not your work here. La, this is warm. So how 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 does that negotiation happen? Because I did see like in 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 Beauty's gift, these women talk about it like, no, we're not. Beauty has died. We're not going to go through this. Us, we're going to be different. And 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 I thought it was it was beautiful and uh, a fantastic way of discussing friendship. But I, but I was wondering about the practicality of it. You know, life is a is a strange thing, and the way we children are raised uh, is stranger still because you can only raise your children the way you were raised and uh, when you reach a certain stage late teens early 20s you wake up to the errors of your parents that's time for you to take charge of your own life and nothing beats being independent nothing beats that and if parents could find it in their hearts to encourage their children to grow up to stand alone to be themselves to love themselves and to teach them or guide them into knowing that self-love is crucial no one no one can love you more than you love yourself. No one. They can tell you that, but it is not humanly possible to love another human being more than you love yourself. Because it's true. Loving another person comes from self-love. In other words, how you love yourself will determine how you love others. The base is you and how you love yourself, how you respect yourself. You cannot go and do for somebody else what you cannot do for yourself. We have tried it as women, where you will go and pick up somebody in the gutters and think you will love <laughs> and think you will love them enough that you will improve them. They have given up on themselves. And you are going to love them so that they begin to love you? When they don't love themselves. 
I'm not saying you cannot reach out and help someone to reclaim their own lives. But don't do it so that you think they can love you more than they have rubbed themselves. <laughs> it won't happen. It cannot happen. They have lost it. If they don't respect themselves, don't love themselves, where are they going to find it? To love you? From where? That empty barrel? Yeah. No. Love yourself. Daughters, sons, learn to grow up and be independent. That means the boys must learn to cook and iron and do laundry. And not go and fool somebody's daughter. I love you. When they need a housekeeper. <laughs> <laughs> People <laughs> should get married because they want to enhance each other's happiness. Mm. Not to lean on. No, there should be no leaning. Two fully grown, independent people get together to be happier together. Nobody can give you happiness. Mm. Happiness springs from inside. It's not given to you. Absolutely. Therefore, when somebody makes you unhappy, you remove yourself with all you've got, including your happiness, which is inside you. <laughs> and before you get married, you go to the bank and get a financial advisor so that you have three accounts, his, hers, and ours. <laughs> <laughs> At this point in time, uh, we're, uh, we're, I think we're, we're running out of time. So I would like to ask if there are any questions from the audience for Dr. Sindhuwe Magona. <laughs> from next month, people can relax. I'll have six months and be happy. And then, uh, but don't mama me. There's another, there's another essay about that. Oh, I agree oh, yeah, with yeah. you, actually. Um, we late. Ama, Ama Taiju eh? has, has the same thing. Uh, Ama Taiju says no, the no, same thing. No, no, the thing is, people, saying. you know, I have a friend visiting me in New York. She's my age, we are in our 40s. We go to Macy's. <laughs> I mean, then, then. We go to Macy's. She's South African, Lindy, so you know. She's standing there, and then the lady who's helping her behind says, Yes, ma'am. Lindy, when looks behind her for the ma'am. All her life, nobody has ever addressed her as ma'am. Because if you're black, your name is mama. No more mama. <laughs> you can say ma'am, you can say miss, you can say Cindy, we even. Fine. Not ma. Ma. <laughs> and there you heard it. She ain't your mama. <laughs> no. S sorry, questions? Yes, sir. That was fabulous. I, I really enjoyed it. I think everybody did. Anyway, I just want to know, who was the publisher that gave you your first big break into your first big book? Thanks. Look at me. Do I look like I was given any breaks? <laughs> <laughs> um, this is why I'm always so empathetic when people look for publishers. I won't bore you with a long story. But somebody took my manuscript to a publisher. I didn't know how to do it. But my first book came out from David Phillip Publishers. David, David Phillip oh. Publishers, yes, Thanks. yes. What has been, um, you've won multiple awards. What has been your most important award? What has mattered to you the most? Dear God. I have no idea what you're talking about. You know, they are... <laughs> Don't let's go into our words. Okay. <laughs> All right. And um, for those of you not in the know... Um, Once I went to a writer's retreat, mm. if you laugh, I'll do a Donald Trump on you and say, I will not want to be your friend. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've only ever been to a one writer's retreat. Mm. You know how I got there? I can't fill forms online. I was invited to it. So that has been something I haven't, I haven't. Mm. That's why I started Beauty's Gift. Okay. Nice. If you know of a writer's retreat that invites people, mm -hmm. 
ask them to invite me. I'm available. <laughs> I'll, I'll actually hook you up. I got you. Um, okay, so so awards we're not going to talk about. <laughs> um, but your writing process. Uh, when do you write? Uh, do you are you one of those people who you oh, do one thousand words I found, a day? I found time. Mm. I made time. I found time. You know, when I started writing. <coughs> Then I went to workshops, and, and, and then you, you must make time. Where are you going to get the time? Mm. You know how busy our lives are? Yeah. And then I discovered the miracle. Rich or poor, we all have 24 hours. I can't say discrimination. Rich people have more time. Nah, 24 hours. So I looked at my 24 hours and found where the hours went. 7 to 7 was not mine, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Get up, get dressed, go to the UN, come back, uh, you know, eat, get, you know, get, go to bed. But from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m., what am I doing? I know. You know what I was doing? <laughs> That's TV. <laughs> Watch, watching people who are getting paid on television. <laughs> Is anything crazier than that? We, I gave away my, my TV. I had one in the living room, one in the dining room, one in the kitchen, in case while I'm, something is happening. Can you be, the only place I didn't have a, a TV set was in the bathroom. I gave, I went to the children at university. You can take this one. I stayed for a year without a, a television and I, I found that I could get into bed at eight o'clock and fall asleep in, in summer. In New York, even nine o it, the sun is out, I don't care. I close my, my blinds and I fall asleep. And then at two o'clock, I get up. Mm. And then I. Two o'clock, nobody bothers you. Nobody bothers you. Nobody quiet. bothers you. And you can then pretend. I, you, you, this is not true, you know that. But I tell myself the whole silly world, ordinary people are fast asleep that goddess creates. Mm. You can be a goddess at two o'clock in the morning. Mm. You can be anything you want to be. You know, encourage yourself, you know, flatter yourself, pretend you are anything and everything and you are. You are what you pretend to be. Mm. It, 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 it gives you an injection that's better than drugs. Mm. Much, much better because it doesn't take away anything from you afterwards. Absolutely. Um, and on that note, uh, because you actually just did a masterclass right now, uh, writing masterclass. Um, you, you, you make you, the time, you, you make the time. You, you started uh, Google to Writers, uh, Writers uh, Workshop and uh, Writers Group. And you know, one of the things that I've been asked when I, when I, when I wrote my, my first book is I actually wrote it at, a, at the computer at work because I didn't have one. But uh, I always say to people, and I'm one of the privileged black women in this, in this country. Mm. Um, now, with the Google Letter Writers Group, how does that work? I know the, there are always so many stories, and I always think, you know, there's so many women, I'm just privileged to be able to have a voice to do that. But how does that work for them? Do they, do they, um, do you uh, get them to write the stories or tell them, or how do, how do you do it? Well, we stopped during COVID. Mm. I was actually challenged last week. At <laughs> when are we going to start? You know, the way I think we will do it this time is a little improved from last time. We used to meet at our homes and at the center for the book. And some wrote longhand, and then, you know, when the the manuscript were finished, I got people to do the typing and, the, you know, that's how we did it. Now, it will be different okay. because, oh, so. because I'm, I'm better organized. Okay. <laughs> All right. I thought I saw a question at the back. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Firstly, I adore you. Um, so, if I remember correctly, um, you were age 23 with your daughter, right? I would imagine that is a time where you feel like you failed completely as, you know, a, a black child. How now, 
you're at the age where you are and there's all this confidence and you're teaching us all that you're teaching us today. How did you, like, where did you draw that strength from? Like, when in that moment, age 23, your life is supposedly falling apart, what did you, like, how did you look at yourself and you're like, okay, this is what's going to propel me forward. This is what's going to drive me to, you know, get out of this, this supposed dark hole that you were probably in. I'd imagine. I, I think I've already answered that question, but I'll go back to it. I think the realization that I had three people who were dependent on me and me only. The myth I had grown up with that there would always be a man beside me loving me and supporting me was gone. And I woke up to the fact which I deal with in do not choose poverty, that I was in a bad spot at 23. I needed to be careful. I didn't make it worse. For five years after my husband left me, I didn't even want a boyfriend. I didn't want another child. I already had three too many because I was not prepared for them. No one should have a child when you don't have a house they can call their home. I do not mean your mother's house, yeah. your own. Yeah. No one should have a child when they don't have a job and can support. No child can thrive when you yourself have nothing. You, people are lucky I'm not the president. <laughs> if you need a, a license to drive a car, by now you would need a license to have a child, if I were president. But the thing is I got so angry and so angry at myself that I had made such bad choices. But I knew it was up to me. The, I could be angry at the husband who had left. If he cared, he would not have left. I could be angry at the government who didn't know I lived. It wouldn't help. I could be angry at society. It wouldn't help. I was it. One must take responsibility for oneself. No one else can. Don't expect anybody to better you. You are who you are, and the choices you make make the who you will be. Just wake up to the fact that you have a life to live, and it may be long. I was in my 20s. 60 years later, if I had waited for that husband, where would I be? It's your life and it's beautiful. It could even be more beautiful. There is so much to, to, to enjoy in living. There's traveling. There. Oh my golly. That is why I look at young people and I wish I could put them in a basket and, and grow them. But I can't. They have to grow themselves to enjoy a full life. You know what it looks like, a full life? <gasps> <laughs> I think we have time for one more question and then we have to end. Okay, so we have a, fa um, a question from Facebook from Janine Pretorius. It goes, um, since Dr. McGonagher writes across genres, how does she transition between them, uh, um, approach the story, choose um, and get into characters specifically for the children's books? Would you like me to repeat the question? Yeah, make it simple so I can understand it. <laughs> so, so they're asking how do you go across genres um, and transition? Part particularly when you're writing children's books. So from you write it from the... You, you become the child. You write, you write what the child is doing, what, you know, how they are feeling. That's it. You really do, but of course then you add your little yeah. grown-up stuff on the side. You know, and children give you the books. Mm -hmm. I had a, um, a three-year-old last month celebrating a three-year-old uh, grandniece. Mm -hmm. So I call to wish a happy birthday. I call rather late, like six o'clock, five, six o'clock. Hello, happy birthday. I pour in the loo, I pour in the loo, I pour in. <laughs> 
That's your story. <laughs> because her birthday thing is not as important as her achievement. I put in the loo. I <laughs> so the story then becomes what was before, what that, you know, how she got to the and how she's enjoying it. It's a, you know, children's books are not easy to, to write, mm. but they are a delight to read they are, because absolutely. they they take you back to the child and you can you can you you can you can almost touch the excitement i mean imagine somebody you wouldn't talk about going to the loo would you mm. but to that child mm. this is a great An achievement, achievement. Uh -huh. so why shouldn't she boast about her achievement that's where what happens when you reach for this you know the stars mm. The stars are anything that seems impossible. When you get it, you f even I can feel tall, huh? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you worked on a on a. You and I worked on a project together without knowing that we were up until the books came out, yeah. and it was uh, where an adaptation of. Uh, uh, classic fairy tales to make them African, and you did the Ugly Duckling. Yeah. I'm curious to know why you chose the Ugly Duckling. Oh, I wish I could. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> why did I choose? I don't know. Okay. I really don't know. I can't remember why I chose the Ugly Duckling, and I really d never mind. Let <laughs> me not bore it with my lack of wisdom. <laughs> never that. But it's a story that is worth repeating because a lot of us including Mohamem, a lot of us uh, uh, have in complexes that are not healthy and you do need someone to nudge you in the right direction so that you wake up to the real you who is perfect each and every human being is perfect god made and no one can improve on what God makes. Mm -hmm. We look different, we are different, but because we are created the way we are, we are perfect as we are. Mm -hmm. Perfect. There's bullying and those, those kind of things, and these are the things writers and other artists address today, because it's unhealthy to look at somebody else and you decide they are not perfect who are you well as you can see this conversation could have gone on and on but i am getting indication that our time is absolutely already up. imagine that <laughs> um everyone this has been the life and times of dr cindy wemagona and we are at the 26th time of the writer festival coming to you live from durban uh, thank you, Dr. Magona. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sukiso Awana. Thank you very much, Dr. Sindiwe Magona. Next month, Dr. Sindiwe Magona is going to be honored in Georgia, uh, in the U.S., for the incredible work that she's done throughout her lifetime. She's also going to be honored at UWC in August. We're delighted that we could be the trendsetters oh. and kick off <laughs> with honoring you <laughs> this year. Once again to Sibashle and her team, Scout Finn, Nolwazi Nene, and Nomtandazo Shandu. Thank you very much for the enormous work that you've done in putting this festival together. Thank you to the rest of the CCA team for the logistics and for the organizational support that you provided to the curatorial team. As Professor Hlongwa mentioned, we can't do this without the support of our funders. So to the University of KwaZulu-Natal, the National Arts Council, the PESP Fund, which has allowed us to engage 10 young emerging artists this year, and so to Luchikalunako 
and the Yes Youth Programme for their support. Then, of course, to the KwaZulu-Natal uh, Department of Art and Culture, we thank you as well for your support. To our partners, the Alliance Francais, the Embassy of Ukraine, uh, the Witz Writing Center, and the Witz Center for the Study of the U.S., we thank all of you for your contributions. That wasn't a signal. You'll notice books enlightened. Even the dark escom stayed out tonight. <laughs> so to all of you, thank you very much. Please uh, stick around. There's going to be some food. There's going to be some drink. And if you've watched closely enough, you'll notice that Dr. Magona has a dancing shoes on. So we are going to dance when the music kicks up as well. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you. Thank you.